Amen. It's been an awesome service so far. Has it not been, church? Oh, man, it's been an adventure scene. Uh, first of all, the amazing performance by Naomi and Nisha. Let's give it up for them one more time. And uh, Jack, Jack's communion really moved me to know that uh, Christianity is not just about us loving God. No, it's about how much God loved us. And this morning, I really pray you feel the love from everybody. But just know that today's service is not about us loving God, but really about God loving us. And because of that, we want to love him back. Amen? Amen. You know, as a church, we've been going through the book of John. And I know that uh, we haven't been together in quite some weeks. And uh, we had a sermon series continued in the downtown region. But we're just going to pick it up where we left off in the book of John. Amen? Amen. But before we dive in, let us hold hands as family and pray before we dive into God's word. Father, we come before you at the, at the very point in our lives where you've chosen us to be here. God, we can't explain why all the things happen in our life, but through your word, I pray you shine light to our situation, shine light to our relationships, shine light to our mind and our hearts so we could walk out of this room transformed by your word, God. Father, it's been so special to see new friends here and to see the, the, the family come together and can't wait for the fellowship with the poke bowls and the pork and chicken. Uh, but I pray right now, Father, you shake off any distractions, any, anything that would distract us from your word and you allow us to have our hearts zoomed in. We know Satan wants to lure us away to other things, but I know that your intent for bringing us here this morning was not for the food and for the fellowship, but more so we could get to know you, Father. So I pray that through your scriptures this morning, we really come to know you. We love you. We dedicate this sermon in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen. amen. Let's be over in the book of John. Now remember, we got out of the GLC feeling pretty victorious, as Angie reminded us. And yet, who was the author of Revelation? John. And so John wrote the book of Revelation, some of the most intense passages, but he also wrote the book of John. And we've already gone through chapter one, two, and three and talked about the beloved disciples. And do we still want to be the beloved disciples? People known to be as one whom is loved by God. And yet we also went over a few weeks ago, chapters four, five, and six where we talked about our faith makes us well. Anybody here feel sick this morning? Well, spiritually sick, you only get healed by your faith. And yet, we also looked at Nick at night, how Nick was trying to be a secret disciple, someone that says I'm a Christian, but only when it's convenient. Well, we learned that Jesus transformed him from Nick at night to Nick in the light. And th that's what God does when we go to his word. Amen. He transforms us. We learn from John how he in his gospel has everything about 90% unique to any other gospel. We also learned that there are only eight miracles recorded in the book of John. Why is that important? Because so often people in the world want a sign, some kind of miracle to happen. And yet the Bible says, look. If Jesus rose from the dead and that doesn't convince you, nothing else will. And so John wrote the whole book of John really only writing eight miracles that Jesus did because it wasn't about the miracles. It was about who he was. And that is why we see the seven I am statements in the book of John. You see, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate, the shepherd, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth and the life. And my personal favorite, I am the true vine. There are five themes to the book of John. The first one is Jesus Christ is the son of God. So all throughout the scriptures, he was really trying to portray that God gave us Jesus so that we as people know about God. Now, how many of us here would rather watch a movie than read a book? Most of us here, yes. Now, God knows that we need to see it. And so what did God do? He sent down Jesus. And when you wonder, what would God do? How much does God love us? We look at Jesus. 
And Jesus, his example, his perfection, his care, his compassion, his concern, as we're going to read this morning, teaches us about who God is. The second theme in the book of John is eternal life. I mean, John just loved, I mean, you talk about the beloved John. He, he just wanted to be with God. And it's interesting because he was the apostle that did not get martyred but was stranded on the island. He wanted to go to heaven, and he was the last one to go out of all the apostles. So God works. I mean, I don't want to go to that mission team. And then you get selected on the mission team. I pray that uh, we have a bunch of people this uh, morning that are ready to be missionaries, maybe to Hawaii. Yo, I want to sign me up for that mission team right there. Be praying for that. No. But he talked about eternal life, how we have a home in heaven. The third theme of the book of John is belief. Not a belief that says, well, I'm saved because I believe. No, 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 no. A belief that changes your everyday life. And so you notice, even as we're going to read today, John loved to take note of, oh, man, then they believed. And I always thought it was interesting that it says, then the disciples really believed. Because I go, how many times do you believe? And isn't that true as us disciples? We believe, we become disciples, and then we need to believe again. And then we really believe. And so John noted down all the times people believe, and we're going to start with the sermon where the disciples didn't believe. It got hard. The fourth theme, though, is the Holy Spirit. Now, what's incredible about the Holy Spirit? That Jesus said, look, guys, I'm about to head out. I'm about to go back to my Father. I leave you a gift. The Holy Spirit. And anybody who repents of their sin, gets baptized for the forgiveness of their sins, receives the Holy Spirit. And Jesus multiplied himself through the Holy Spirit. That means now when you get baptized and you have a powerful Christian life, what ends up happening? You make a difference wherever you're at. You're, you, you go to school. What happens when Bernice goes to work? She's a little Jesus at, at the place where she works. She, she, she's, a, she's a doctor in some sense, right? You could ask her about it later. But where she works, she's a little Jesus. Anthony goes to Amazon. He works at Amazon. And he's a little Jesus at Amazon. A prime disciple right there. Prime now disciple because he's a little Jesus. And in and, and Randy, she goes to Tualatin High School. And what is she in the high school? A little Jesus. And so John loved to write about the Holy Spirit because he goes, when you receive the Holy Spirit, and if you're confused, like, I don't know if I received it, just study the Bible with the person that brought you out because you've not yet received it if you're confused about it. It was a special gift. And you don't forget a special gift, amen? The fifth theme is the resurrection. Now, for me, growing up in my church, I just saw Jesus on the cross, very sad, very dead. But he's not dead. He resurrected. And so if we were to have a real visual of who he is, you would see the resurrected Messiah, and you could read all about it. John was fired up about it. He wrote about it in Revelation. Amen? What did the disciples do after Jesus died? You guys remember? Jesus said, go make disciples of all nations. And then he left to heaven, and what did the disciples do? They went upstairs. They were scared. They go, man, Jesus is gone. And it wasn't until the sisters, and it's awesome to have sisters, amen? The sisters were like, no, he's not dead, he's alive. And then the disciples turned from being scaredy, cat, frightened people upstairs, locking the door, to powerful disciples. The same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead is now inside you. And so John loved that theme. He goes, when Jesus resurrected, everything changed. And I put before you this morning, if you really believe Jesus, Jesus resurrected, it's going to really change your entire life. Now we pick it up in John 6, where it got pretty hard for the disciples. Today we're going to be going over chapters 7, 8, and 9 in the book of John. But we pick it up in 6, verse 60. It says, on hearing this, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to him, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. What happened right here? They said, Jesus, 
Your teachings are way too hard. Have you ever wondered and thought that same thing? Like you get into some Bible studies and let's face it, I was talking to someone today that's studying the Bible. They said, you know, I never knew it was going to be this hard. I didn't know what I was getting myself into when I met these guys. The disciples felt the same way about Jesus. After a long sermon, one of the longest chapters in the Bible, John 6, he goes, man, the disciples took a step back. They said, wait a minute, Jesus. This is a hard teaching. And you know what happens? Look in John 6, verse 66. And from this time on, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Wow. Didn't that just hit you right there? Many of the ones that were followers of Jesus stopped following him. Look at what Jesus says in verse 67. Please don't leave. I love you guys. Okay, sorry. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go to? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe. Jesus' hard teachings only expose who's a real follower. And this morning, I want to give you guys this preparatory scripture. It's not part of the sermon. It's a preparatory scripture. I just made that up, but it, it's one scripture that prepares us for what we're going to hear. Because you might leave here this morning going, whoa, this is a hard teaching. But Jesus faced the same thing. And that's why the title of the sermon this morning is The Truth Will Set You Free. The truth is not meant to scare people away, but if you are scared away, it's normal. But just know if you persevere, it will set you free. What was Jesus' response? He goes, does this offend you guys, really? A hard teaching? And he says, what if I just open up the heavens? They've been doing some work in this building, so we've opened up the ceilings a little bit. I don't know if you can see the cables there. Maybe some plumbers here know about it, but they're, they're doing some work. But imagine if the whole roof was open and then the whole clouds were just cracked in the middle and we could see heaven. We could see God. We could see the angels. Would that change your attitude this morning about being here? Would that waken you up a little bit? Jesus goes, oh, this is hard for you. What if I just crack open and show you heaven where I came from? That's when Peter goes, oh, no, Jesus, we're not going anywhere. You're stuck with us because we've come to believe. We're going to follow you. And so this morning, let's not be the ones that no longer followed him, but let's be the ones that have come to believe in God's word. Amen? Let's go to chapter 7 and dive into the sermon. That concludes our preparatory scripture. John 7, verse 16. Jesus answered, My teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether I speak on my own. Whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory. But he who seeks the truth, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keep the law. Why are you trying to kill me? You're demon-possessed, the crowd answered. Who's trying to kill you? And everybody was trying to kill him, amen? What do we see here? Jesus says, hey, I want to show you the truth. This truth is going to help you be a man of truth. And so our first point, set free to be a man of truth. Nice. Set free. To be a man of truth. You see, I don't know about your life, but I became a disciple at about 18 years old. And I could honestly say the few years I was there in sin and the darkness, it was a time of falsehood. I was different to different people. I told my mom something. I told my brother something. I told my friend something. I had a girlfriend here. I would tell her something. I had a girlfriend over there. I would tell her something else. I had a group of friends that I would click with, but we, it was just lies. And for me, even got to the point where I was a pathological liar, meaning I didn't consider myself a liar because some lies are okay and some little lies help people. And, you know, I just, I started believing my own lies. 
So when I became a Christian, I would tell the whole story to the disciples and be like, sorry guys, that was a lie made up. I just realized that never happened because I was just a man of lies. And in my religiosity, I was also a, 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 in a falsehood. I was not a man of truth. And how do you know you're a man of truth? Well, you call yourself a Christian. Could you show someone why you are a Christian? Could you grab the Bible and say, look, this is why I got converted. But if you don't know your Bible, you're not a real Christian. And so I, when I started the Bible, I go, wait a minute. I'm not a man of truth. Because if someone was to say, Caesar, teach me. I'd be like, no, dude, I don't know. Just maybe say a prayer. I've got a pamphlet once and I opened it up. Maybe you could start with that. Maybe go ask the, the preacher that has the robe and the incense. He could probably help you out. He went to seminar school. But I didn't know Jesus had expected us individually to be set free from falsehood. You know what's amazing is Jesus says here, do you want to know if my teaching comes from me? Then choose to do the will of God. You know, I, I think inside of us, God invented us to want to know the truth. But we suppress it with sin. We don't really want to know the truth because it's going to call us to change. And man, when you have to change, it hurts. The truth hurts sometimes, doesn't it? And Jesus wanted to set you free, so he said, choose to do the will of God. How do you know you've decided to do the will of God? Have you been going after seeking the truth? Do you, do you get, the, in the Bible studies, questions? Do you show up to D times ready to ask questions or, or just seek to understand? You know, I love the scripture in Hebrews 5 in Spanish. It says, you no longer understand because... Entra por un oído al otro. That means it goes in through one ear and out the other. I was shocked when I read that because my mom always used to say that to me. And I go, that's in the Bible. You know, this, you're not understanding because it's going one ear out the other. Isn't that frustrating, parents, when that happens with your kids? You're giving them a rebuke of a lifetime. You think they're learning and they're just like, yeah, what? What? What do you mean what? And yet Jesus says the same thing. You come to church. You come to DTEM. You come to Bible studies. But then your actions show that you were just going, what? I, I didn't get that. This is why in this church we come with our Bibles and we want to seek to understand. Because Jesus doesn't expect us to stay in a falsehood state. But he's called us to seek truth. And this is why in verse, let's keep reading, verse 28. He says, Jesus, teaching in the temple, cried out. Yes, you know me. And you know where I'm from. I am not here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him. But I know him because I am from him. And he sent me. I mean, you got to love how hardline Jesus was. I mean, it's always funny when people think Jesus was this man with blonde hair, blue eyes, sitting by a rock and a sheep saying, peace, peace, everybody come to me. I accept everyone as you are. No, Jesus right here is going and looking at the crowds and he's saying, you don't know God. Have people confronted you with the truth? That means sit down with you and help you understand. You know, I'll never forget studying the Bible with Daniela because honestly, God set up a Bible study with me and her because the sisters were supposed to get with her and she was running a little late. So Hannah had to leave. Debbie had to leave. And I was just sitting there with Neo, so I said, you know, Neo, why don't we just do a quick Bible study? <laughs> and it was me, Janelle, and we sat down with Daniela, and you could tell there was a sense of pride. I know it. I, I know it. And so I'd be talking to her, and she goes, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. And I was like, Daniela, you haven't even let me finish. She goes, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. And then as soon as we start, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. And so I just closed the Bible. I said, look, it's very hard to talk to you. And she just kind of froze. I said, I'm trying to explain something to you, but you feel like you already know. Why are you here studying the Bible? And she just goes, what, 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 what am I supposed to do? Like, be quiet? I said, yes. <laughs> like, that's what you should do when someone's trying to explain something. And Janelle just turns to her and says, yes. <laughs> I think Daniela was looking for, like, help. No, she's, yeah, that's what you should do. But I am so proud of her because even right after that, we started opening up the scriptures, and you could tell there was a change. You could tell there was, like, okay, 
I want to be taught. I, I need to know the truth. And there was almost like a sense of it's kind of hard. Even starting the Bible study, Daniela goes, did Debbie bring you here because it's kind of hard to study with me? <laughs> and, and I couldn't even say no. I just said, you know, you want to be nice, but you don't want to be, it's true. But you know what's amazing, though? I am so proud of this woman because right after that, you could tell she was set free from falsehood. She goes, you know what? Maybe I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I need to be taught. And why didn't people want to be taught by Jesus? Because he was claiming something that was so opposite of their life. And that's what Daniela said. She goes, you know what, Caesar? I'm sorry. No one's just, no one's talked to me like that. And I've never been taught something like this. I need to learn humility. And I go, this is amazing. This is an example of how God sets us free from putting up a front and having to be shown to be somebody. Show up to church, understand you don't know something, and man, is God going to work with you. Some of us come this morning and go, I don't know if I could learn anything. This person, that person, this building, that person. And, and you're hindering your spiritual growth. And Jesus can't set you free. Look in verse 31. Verse 31. Sorry, verse 37. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scriptures have said, rivers of living waters will flow from within them. Isn't that amazing? This is what happens when you're set free from falsehood and become a man or a woman of truth. You become living waters. You become a spring of living waters. You know what's amazing is that I was sitting here talking with Laura and the fellowship and Laura just goes, you know, I just asked her about her story a little bit. She goes, you know, I'm, a few months ago, about four months ago, I met Fran at the mall. And when I, when I got to know her, I was just kind of a little shaky. I wasn't sure. But I started going through some hard times. And I realized that I don't know how to help my family. And what does Jesus say here? He says, if you are living waters, they're going to flow through you. You can't say, yeah, I'm a believer in God. Well, who, how is God flowing through you to other people? Well, he's not. Then you're not a living water for God. And so Laura just it hit her one day when trials came. She just goes, you know, I don't know how to help my family. I don't have things to give. I don't have truth to give. So one day she breaks down, starts crying, and calls Faran crying. And she just goes, I just, I need help. I, I just, I need truth. I need to know what it's going to take for me to have what God wants me to have. She'd realized, I don't really have God. Well, she made some changes. She started studying the Bible. She's been with us already to every meeting of the body for some time. And today after service, Laura's getting baptized. Amen. She's now free from falsehood. She will become a living water so that not just her family, but wherever she goes, she's a flow of living waters. She's now a woman of truth. And you know when someone's a woman of truth, now they have a confidence. I have God. I want to ask you, do you have a confidence? I am a man of God. I am a woman of God. Please ask me some questions about God. Because if you seek God... He will free you, and you could become a man or a woman of truth. Amen? Let's go to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 1. Our second point is free from sin. John 8, 31. Verse 1. It's the theme scripture, John 8, 31, so I'll keep saying that a few times. I'm sorry. John 8, verse 1. Then they all went home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Did you guys catch that? Everybody went home, and Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. What did Jesus do at the Mount of Olives? He prayed. I mean, he just loved to pray. He just goes, I know everyone's going home. I'm going to go pray. What do you do after you pray? You feel fired up, right? If you pray correctly. You feel fired up. Well, look what Jesus does after he's fired up because he prayed. Verse 2, at dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts 
where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group. And they said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, it commands us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down. He started to write down on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left. With the woman still standing there, Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. Just picture this for a second. Jesus, after an awesome prayer time with God, he's starting to teach the people in the middle of his sermon. A group of people come in with a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. What does that mean? She probably doesn't have clothes on. She was in the act of adultery. They caught her, grabbed her, and put her in front of everyone. They made her get in front of everyone. What does that mean? She didn't want to. They made her get in front of everyone. Said, Jesus, what do you think we should do with her? And Jesus has something very wise to say. He goes, well, if you guys haven't sinned, then go ahead and stone her. And it says the older people left first because usually the older people are the wiser people. And so the wiser people said, you know what? We've sinned a lot. And the older you get, the more you sin in your life. So they go, you know what? We should get going here. Let's have a fellowship break. This is not good. <laughs> and yet the other ones started leaving one by one until it was just Jesus and this woman. And when it was Jesus and this woman, you get to see the touch and the care of God. That goes, you know, I don't condemn you. Go and leave your life of sin. Jesus freed her from her sin. People think sometimes church is a place to come and to just feel better. Like hopefully you feel better about your sin. No, he's here to free you from your sin. And let's be honest, some of us went to church just to feel better about our sin. Like when you go to school and the fall term is started at PSU, so hopefully I already challenged every disciple at PSU, you're going to get straight A's, amen? So be putting that pressure on all the PSU students. Devante, we already talked about it. Don't worry, Eric and Tony, we already challenged them on what he needs to do to get straight A's. Alessia, Severine, everyone, Arrow. And, and yet what happens when you get a grade and it's better than other people? You feel pretty excited about that, right? You go, you, you got an 80? What did you get? I got a 70. Whew, I feel better about my 80. And yet sometimes that's how we do Christianity. Well, I'm more committed than that person, so I feel pretty good about myself. Or we look at Jesus and say, well, how's his commitment? What does he tell us? Go and leave your life of sin. You know, every time someone gets baptized, I always ask them, hey, what's the hardest thing you had to give up? For Sharice, he said, you know what? It was my lifestyle. It was how I was living. I was partying all the time. And when she was studying the Bible, she said, I went back home and I was asked, do you want to go out tonight? And Cherie said, there she made a decision. I have to count the cost here. Do I go out and do what I'm used to in my sin and probably wake up regretting what I do? Or do I give this a shot? I don't know where it's going to take me. She said she sat there counting the cost. And she said, I decided I'm not going to go out. I'm going to tell my friends that I'm going to give it up. And then Sharice was baptized. Amen. But because she was free from sin, she's able now to go preach the word. And it was so funny because we, they, the, the, the ministry, campus ministry had a family time where you go and you are up there and you preach the word. Has anyone done a preach off before? Yes. 
Well, a preach off is you grab a random person and they, they give you a scripture and you preach it to everybody. And Charisse goes, hey, this is what I've already been doing at my family's house. <laughs> I've been actually doing this. I've been preaching to, and, 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 and you know what? Maybe her parents weren't responding so fast and started persecuting. But somebody did in her family, her sister Fafa. And Fafa last Sunday got baptized, amen? But Fafa had to make the same decisions. Am I going to live an adulterous life in the eyes of God? Or am I going to count the cost and be freed from my sin? You know, I don't know what your sin is. But you need to ask yourself this morning, are you seeking to feel better about your sin? For approval about your sin? Like, I'm just looking for a church that will accept my lifestyle. Well, you're not seeking for truth, and the truth will not set you free. I'll never forget when I was really challenged with the scriptures. Because truth does hurt. And I don't know who said it, but somebody said, you can't handle the truth. Who said it? Somebody who said, you can't handle the truth. Michael Smith, you know? Amen. But Jesus didn't say it, but he knew it. And this is why when we look in verse 31, now we get to go to verse 31. He says, to the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. And then you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. They answered him, this is awesome. We've been looking to be freed from our sin. I'm just making sure you guys are following along here, amen? We don't believe that I know all the answers. We are people that want to follow the Bible as a church. Verse 33, they answered him, we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I love Jesus' promise here. You will be free indeed. But he has a simple formula. Hold to my teachings. If you hold to my teachings, what does this mean? If you don't know the teachings, can you really hold to the teachings? No. But he says, if you hold to my teachings. And I say this because Jesus is very, very simple. We're going to talk about it in the next chapter. He's very simple. Who complicates things? Us. When we don't go to Jesus, but we go to our spouse or our children, then we start complicating what it means to be a disciple. Like, I'm, I know this is what Jesus said, but you don't understand my situation. You don't understand how I messed up in life. And this is why I have to be like this. And I appreciate what Laura said. Laura said, you know, the hardest thing for me is, is commitment. Like, just, I got to be committed. And now she understands Jesus being Lord of my life, I'm not going to be set free from sin unless I hold to his teachings. What are Jesus' teachings? First, seek first the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom. You know, I'll never forget the first time I came to this church, somebody said, hey, is church your favorite place to be at? I said, no. That's like the least favorite place to be at. But I do it because I need to feel better about the week. I do it because I know that's what my mom wants me to do. But it's not my favorite place to be. Our service was one hour and it, lasts, and it felt like three. And he said, well, if church is not your favorite place to be, then you're going to the wrong church. And I don't know how biblical that was, but it helped me. Because I said, okay, let me take a step back here. I don't understand God. Because church for me was a place to go. It wasn't a lifestyle thing. But why did that happen? Because I was not freed from my sin. What are some of Jesus' teachings? Go make disciples. You know why it gets hard to share your faith? I realize it's one of three things. Number one, because you're losing your faith. You're losing it. So it's hard to share your faith when you're losing your faith. Or number two, you've lost your faith already. You've lost it. Or number three, you never had it to begin with. So why is it so hard to go and share your faith with a bunch of people? Because either you don't have it or you lost it already. And how do we get faith? The scriptures say it. 
you get in his word. And so this morning, the challenge for all of us, get into his word this week. Get into Bible studies. If you were invited out by a guest, you don't have to be Hawaiian. You could sign up for Bible studies with who brought you out. And you ask the questions you need to. Clear up the doubts that you have. And I know there's a couple things that will get us in the way, and it's pride. Feeling like I already know it. Feeling like who could this person, what could this person teach me? But here's the exciting thing. You're going to take a step back from your life and go out one or two ways. Fighting it like these guys did. I mean, isn't it a beautiful scripture? The truth will set you free. And how did these guys respond? They said, We've never been slaves, Jesus. What are you talking about? We're the Israelites. We're God's people. They were so hard-hearted, they had forgotten. The Israelites were slaves. They were slaves to the Egyptians. That's why they needed to be set free by Moses. They were slaves to the Babylonians. They were slaves to the Assyrians. So these guys were so hard-hearted that they had forgotten their very own sin. And that's how Satan works. You know, for me, I look back when I studied the Bible, it was the first time God's word shined light to my life. That means it, 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 it's compared to a mirror. It helped me see all the bad inside of me. I said, whoa. I mean, I wanted to run from this thing because I was like, this is not, this cannot be me. I consider myself to be a good person. But you know what else it did? It helped me see all the good inside of me. I didn't know I could love like this. I didn't know I could care for someone like this. The only reason we go to our sin, be it pride or drugs or sex, or sometimes when someone doesn't go and deal with drugs or sex, they start going into pride and selfish ambition. And I realized I never, ever got freed from my sin, and that's why my heart was hard. I didn't know the good or the ugly. But it was so exciting when on April 11, 2010, I was freed from my sin. You know, we always ask, when were you free from your sin? And when a true disciple was free from their sins, they're going to know when that was. If you look at Rich, Rich, when were you freed from your sin? Fourth of July. That's that's pretty easy. It's Independence Day. Freedom. Jack, when were you freed from your sin? February 28th. February 28th. One day away from leap year. We look at George. George, when were you freed from your sin? February 4th, Valentine's Day. He'll forever have Jesus as his Valentine. <laughs> Rich Hardy, when were you freed from your sin? October 24th. October 24th. It's coming up here in a few weeks. Yeah. Isn't it exciting when it's your birthday? Today is Victor's birthday, amen? Yeah. And, and it's exciting when it's your birthday, but when you've been freed from your sin and it's your spiritual birthday... There's nothing like your first spiritual birthday, right, Janelle? She celebrated it last week. You just feel excited because I've really been freed from my sin. My question is if you can't come up with the day you were freed from your sin, you got to ask yourself if you're still a slave to sin. Maybe because you don't know. And you know what? Maybe you just weren't taught this. But today is an incredible opportunity. God's word is very simple. We complicate it. Jesus came to free us from sin. And just like this woman, she must have been so fired up. She probably thought she was going to die that day in the most embarrassing, a shameful death. And Jesus comes and says, no, 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 you're free. For you, I don't know how you come this morning, but let it be a a leaving difference. That you say, you know, I'm ready. I don't want to die a shameful death. I don't want to be adulterous in the sight of God. I want that Jesus touch that sets me free. Amen. Let's go to John chapter 9 to close out. John chapter 9, verse 1. Verse 1. As Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind. Now, I don't know about you, but it must not feel good to, number one, be blind and then hearing people talk about how it's your fault. Right? This guy's blind and then you just hear people say like, hey, Jesus, this guy, it's, he sinned, right? That's why he's blind. 
And this is probably what he's been through his whole life because that was the custom of this day. But look in verse 3. Neither this man nor his parents sin, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground. He made some mud with the saliva and he put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. The word means sent. So the man went and washed and he came home seen. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the man who was used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, no, no, I am the man. Well, how then were your eyes open, they asked. He replied, well, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He skipped over the spit part, and maybe you would too, amen. <laughs> he told me to go to Siloam and wash, so I went and I washed. And then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. You notice how Jesus sees a man born blind. And our last point is free from being blind. This man is born blind. And Jesus goes, no, 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 no. This man's not born blind because of his sin. He's born blind so God's power could be at work in him. Who here has been impacted in any way by John 9's story of the blind man? Raise your hand if you've been impacted somehow by this story. Look around the room. There's so many hands. This man born from being blind, probably doubting God a lot. And I share this because a lot of you doubt God because of the challenges you were given, because of the past, because of what he's allowed you to go through, because of the things that you have or the things that you don't have. And isn't that us in our nature? Why couldn't I be smarter? Why couldn't I be more talented? Why couldn't I be given more good looks? I've, taught, I've said that to myself several times. <laughs> But why does God give you what you have? So God's word could be displayed in you. Do you believe God could work inside of you? If you don't, it's because you're looking at yourself and you're not looking at God. This man born blind, he goes, oh, this is why this happened. So that his power could be displayed in me. Paul was a huge sinner, but what did he say about his sin? I'm just an example of how patient God is. I mean, you could be the most undisciplined person, but hey, you're an example that God could work through an undisciplined person. <laughs> you could be the most emotional person. I just get emotional about everything. But you could be an example of how God could work through an emotional person. But I'm so angry and I have fits of rage and I get mad and I punched the wall last week. <laughs> Brother or sister, you are an example that God could work through someone that has anger management problems. Now, you're still called to be freed from your sin, amen? But, but God has displayed his power, and he wants to in your life. But some of us are stopping that because you look at yourself. You're studying the Bible. You go, I don't know, because I just, I can't see correctly how it's all going to work out. And I don't know how you, think about it for a second. If you were born blind... And Jesus goes, don't worry, man, I'm going to heal you. <laughs> He's blind, but you could, you could hear someone spit. <laughs> hey, Jesus, what are you doing? <laughs> don't worry. Ew, is this the spit you just... <laughs> yes. Could I take this off now? Am I... No. Go to the pool of Siloam. That's over 500 yards away. You're talking about five football fields. He needs to go to another pool? There's other pools and lakes and rivers, and I'm sure some kind of water he could take that mud off. But he was free to be able to see once his obedience was complete. He was not going to be able to see until he goes to that very pool, Siloam. And what does Siloam mean? Sent. He goes, just so you know that I've sent you. You know, you may come this morning and you're like, what is this? Like, oh, and it's, it's, it's spit. This is not what I'm used to. It's muddy. It's not what I felt like this was going to be. And Jesus goes, don't worry, just, just obey. You're going to see. You're going to be able to see. 
and you're going to be freed from your blindness. You know, one of the, I believe, is the most intense conversion stories is our brother Jesse. Because this man from 12 years old, involved in drugs and, and already working more full-time job than a, a normal adult. And he's working, he's involved in all kinds of stuff. 20 years old, I've already had several DUIs. And then he was freed from that lifestyle by a man who had given him a vision that he could be a business owner. So he leaves that. He leaves the crazy lifestyle. And he goes, okay, but now I'm going to be able to follow this vision of owning a business and being free from the financial worries of life. And a lot of people, and even here this morning, there's people who believe, if I'm just freed from financial worries, then life would be awesome. You wouldn't have rich people committing suicide. If I was just famous, no, you wouldn't have famous people committing suicide if that was the case. But Jesse goes, I got this vision, I got this plan, I got to get my own business. He would go to work. As soon as he would leave work, he would have another job because he was given the idea, if you just go wholeheartedly in the business here, you're going to be set free from the worries of this life. And one day you're going to be happy, you're going to be freed. And he gave it his heart. Five years gave his entire heart. Wouldn't come home till midnight, woke up early, got his job. And then he met disciples. And disciples helped him see that you could be set free from not just the outward sins, because some of us don't think we're sinful because we don't curse or because we don't go out and drink. and No, there's other kinds of sin. His was greed. This idea that I just, I need more. And so he decides, even though there was mud in his eyes when he was making this decision, like he was very shaky on it. Because Jesus expects obedience without sight. This guy had no sight. And I'm telling you, we do discipleship with people, the kingdom of God, to show them you must give all your heart to the kingdom or else it's not going to work. Or Helen Keller would actually quote this, life is either going to be a great adventure or nothing. That's what Jesus says. Either Christianity is going to be everything in your life, who you marry, who you end up with, where you end up with, who are your relationships or it's going to be nothing. And for Jesse, he goes, you know what? I've been making, even though I was involved in a church, even though I led my own Bible study, I wasn't a true disciple. And he came to be set free from being blind because really that's what it was. Studying the Bible with Jesse was very clear that he had a heart to see and to know God. And even though it was muddy, and let's be honest, someone invited you this morning and things may be a little muddy. And you may go, how am I going to go after life? And if I seek first the kingdom, how, are, how is my job going to be okay with this? And don't we have to have like doctors? And you start thinking all these things instead of what Jesus is calling you to do. He's calling you to give up everything. And this morning, I know God's calling all of us. Let's give our entire hearts to God. In the Portland church, we have the province of Portland plan. That we say, we don't just want these regions. We want to spread throughout all of Portland. What's it going to take? Give your entire heart to your leaders. But they just, they're, they're messing up in this and this and this way. Yes. But you're supposed to lift their arms up. But they're just not experienced. Absolutely, experience starts somewhere and it's starting now. If we don't split up, if we don't regionalize, if we don't raise up the leaders we need to. Even last night, it was awesome seeing Eric and Tony at the shepherding meeting. Because you could tell, even though they have a great hearts to be there, they're probably a little confused about the whole shepherding thing still. But we have to lift their arms up as shepherds. Because they're going to train and one day they are going to be true shepherds. And for you, what is your responsibility? Even though it may be muddy at times. Or uncomfortable. I didn't spit here. This isn't the spit zone. Even though it may be uncomfortable, you'll be set free once your obedience is complete. Jesus wants to set us free from being blind. I'll close with a Helen Keller quote. The only thing that's worse than being blind is having sight but no vision. Let's have vision in Portland and the vision God has in store for you. To God be the glory.